for yet another episode on medical toxicology mainly for medical students but also for practitioners and uh, forensic uh, professionals who are connected with toxicology in some manner or the other today i am here with uh, a lesson a very important lesson from basic medical toxicology i am very happy to present this particular episode because not only does it concern something very important but also because the whole presentation has been designed conceptualized and prepared by my own daughter dr roshni pillai who is now a trainee in the poison control center at amrita institute of medical sciences cochin where i work she has prepared this presentation on arsenic with emphasis on the most important aspects for medical students she has uh, had the experience of uh, dealing with a clinical case on arsenic poisoning while she was working in another hospital and that was presented as a paper a platform presentation in uh, an earlier conference of the indian society of toxicology and she in fact won the best paper award that is why she thought since uh, she has practical experience with this particular poison managing a case of course i helped her out in the analytical aspects we'll come to that later she thought why not present the important aspects of arsenic for medical students because sometimes we think that heavy metals like arsenic are only of historical importance and that they are not commonly encountered anymore nothing can be further from the truth as you will see so we will uh, use this case as a kind of starting point for our discussion on arsenic so let's begin with what exactly happened in this case that dr roshni examined and that i was also involved in as i said analytical and forensic aspects this concerned a 37 year old male working in the it sector in bangalore but he hailed from kerala his house is here april 15 2019 he came home when i say came home this is in bangalore where he was staying at that time because he was working there he had his dinner and immediately after that developed nausea vomiting and loose stools he had to be admitted to a local hospital because it was pretty severe but uh, you know on conservative management he became all right it was treated as a case of food poisoning for the next one month he was okay but then on may 15 2019 he had a similar episode this time after he had finished his dinner and uh, he was about to go to bed when again the same symptoms started but this time the symptoms were more severe and he was admitted to hospital but had to be there for a longer period and during this period he noticed an additional feature which was not present the, on the previous occasion and that's numbness of both hands he was in hospital for about 2 weeks and then he was discharged 
but he noticed that the numbness and tingling extended to his feet also over the next one month. His hands and feet appeared to be constantly numb and there was a kind of pins and needles sensation, what we call tingling. By July 2019, he developed burning sensation of his feet and found it in fact difficult to walk. He also began to notice some alarming changes in the skin, in his palms and soles, in the form of flaking. The skin, the skin was appearing to come off in flakes, what we call in medical terms hyperkeratosis. I'll show you some images later. He became so very much affected that he had to stop working and had to stay at home hoping to recover. But he went into loss of appetite, weight loss, was constantly fatigued and became virtually bedbound. And he had to be readmitted to hospital by the end of that month in July. These are some of the images. Just look at his palm. Palm of the left hand is shown here. He, he took the photograph himself. Classical picture of hyperkeratosis with superficial layers of skin flaking off. Present also in the soles of his feet. You can see in this image, skin flaking off the sole of his left foot. This is a close-up. And uh, therefore, the doctors this time did a very complete kind of evaluation. It was not treated as a case of foot poisoning. It was something else, they thought. So they did a complete checkup. As you can see on this slide, many of the investigations, whatever they felt were relevant, was done. And much of it appeared to be normal, even though there was evidence of anemia, and to some extent leukopenia, there was also evidence of peroneal neuropathy, a little bit of peripancreatic edema, and the neuropathy was primarily demyelinating in nature with secondary axonal loss. Many of the other investigations turned up as normal. It was at this time that uh, some of the doctors felt it could be toxic exposure and they ran a tox screen including heavy metal screen and this is what they got as the result for arsenic level in blood. Just look at the result. The analysis was done by a very good methodology inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry or ICPMS, very reliable method, even more than atomic absorption spectrophotometry, which we usually refer to with regard to analysis of heavy metals in body fluid samples. Most textbooks, that's what is mentioned. But the best method nowadays is said to be ICPMS. And in this particular case, you can see it was pretty high, 63.36 microgram per liter, whereas the reference range shows for normal values not to exceed 12 microgram per liter. Obviously, this man was having arsenic at, in high levels in his body. We will come back to this case a little later. So, we need to talk about this metal, arsenic, a metal with a colorful history. What we refer to as a heavy metal, though strangely, arsenic is not really a classical metal. It's a metalloid. It's an element with metallic properties. It doesn't really belong to the category of heavy metals. There are so many others. Those of you who are fond of rock music don't get excited. Heavy metal does not refer to a kind of rock music. So don't go thinking of Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath and Deep Purple. We are here to talk toxicology. 
and heavy metals is a very very important category of poisons that every medical student needs to know we will discuss some of the common examples beginning with in this session arsenic which as i have already told is a heavy metal with a notorious reputation you can see as to where it is placed in the periodic table but we will not go into the details as far as chemistry is concerned because this is not a chemistry lecture we will only look at briefly the physical characteristics of arsenic and on this slide you can see what i have already stated arsenic is not really a metal it's a metalloid and uh, its salts are very important even more than elemental arsenic it's really the salts which are toxic and they are pretty colorful as you can see here arsenic trioxide also called white arsenic it looks like a white powder arsenic disulfide is called red realgar's reddish in color arsenic trisulfide is yellow opiment copper arsenite is shields green and copper aceto arsenite is paris green colorful salts they may look very attractive but believe me they are pretty toxic and can be lethal and these salts of arsenic have widespread use they may be used as insecticides or wood preservative pigments after all there are variously colored salts and also as a depilatory for removing unwanted hair it's also used in industry especially glass alloys electroplating soldering and it is a it is like lead an an environmental contaminant present in soil water food so we need to be aware that arsenic is constantly present with us in the environment aside from inorganic salts which i listed there are various other organic salts also but as i said i'm not going to the details because this is not a chemistry lecture and medical students don't need to know all those kinds of intricate details all you need to know is given here arsenic trioxide you need to remember because one of the commonest salts of arsenic especially involved in uh, poisoning cases the fatal dose is said to be about 200 to 300 mg can be less also and like many other metals arsenic is also absorbed through all portals including skin though the usual mode of absorption is through the mucosa of the gi tract mechanism of action is linked to sulfhydryl groups of enzymes with which this metal or the metal salt binds as a result of which the enzyme gets inactivated and it it works against many enzymes involving many organ systems it's a multi organ poison in bones arsenic can replace phosphorus and cause damage there also and when you look at features of toxicity both acute and chronic you will see as to how widespread the manifestations can be how protean the manifestations in acute poisoning one of the most important things to remember is that arsenic poisoning can mimic cholera very favorite question in the examination you can see the manifestations here abdominal pain vomiting garlicky breath and most importantly rice water stools or rice water diarrhea like what you see in cholera so sometimes this is mistaken for cholera treated and then the person you know may die and nobody realizes actually he died of arsenic poisoning but there are some differences and you need to know some of the important points to differentiate acute arsenic poisoning from cholera one of the most important is that the diarrhea is virtually painless in cholera whereas in acute arsenic poisoning diarrhea is accompanied usually by colicky abdominal pain or tenesmus kind of cramping pain in the abdomen lower abdomen when passing stools almost never seen in cholera also the rice water stools towards later stages can get blood stained almost never happens in cholera there are also some other differentiating features but these are the most important 
if at all you have a doubt naturally you will have to submit you know the body fluids to necessary analysis you may have to go for a microbiological analysis as well as toxicological analysis and that will clinch the issue aside from uh, gi manifestations there are other manifestations also that you need to remember especially mees lines which are seen in fingernails the image here shows you what is meant by mees lines horizontal whitish or pale bands across the fingernails sometimes referred to as aldrich mees lines but often just referred to as mees lines there can also be hair loss some of these salts that is why they use as depilatory there can be other features also especially related to the liver the kidneys the heart central nervous system peripheral nervous system so we may have fatty degeneration of liver renal failure cardiac arrhythmias convulsions all kinds of issues with regard to chronic poisoning these are the important manifestations to remember melanosis very characteristic that pigmentation of skin especially is seen in the region of the neck the eyelids and uh, the region around the nipples in particular hyperkeratosis of palms and soles are also said to be very characteristic almost pathognomonic for arsenic exposure i've already showed some images of the case that we discussed earlier we'll come back to that case and then there is this so called raindrop pigmentation of the back of the skin shown in one of the images here if you look closely you will find you know pigmentation in the form of raindrops on especially the back of the trunk other manifestations include you know bowen's disease leading to skin cancer there are the usual gi manifestations liver damage renal damage there can also be features related to the nervous system cardiovascular system especially the blood when you examine that you will see evidence of anemia almost always and sometimes also leukopenia and thrombocytopenia the important manifestations that you need to remember i have highlighted in yellow melanosis hyperkeratosis and pigmentation of skin especially the so called raindrop pattern it would be i think pertinent at this particular time to discuss some of the poisons that can produce this kind of dermal pigmentation on ingestion not really local contact but on ingestion often as in the examination so aside from arsenic which causes this dark you know brownish pigmentation where um, you also have certain other examples like chromium and phenacetin there are uh, poisons which can cause bluish discoloration of skin like bismuth phenothiazin drugs silver reddish discoloration with uh, regard to clofazimine and especially rifampicin you have what is called a red man syndrome there we'll come to that later when we discuss uh, the toxicity of rifampicin sometimes there may be yellowish pigmentation that is related to chloroquine overdose or quinacrine picric acid etc please do remember some of the examples for each of these colors because as i said often asked in the examination with regard to diagnosis of arsenic poisoning i have listed some of the important investigations that need to be done i would like to stress on radiography arsenic like most other heavy metals if not all this radiopic we'll come to a list again of uh, radio pig poisons uh, in the next slide but do remember to stress on this in under investigations radiography of the gi tract may reveal especially in acute ingestion evidence of arsenic in the gastrointestinal tract but confirmation of arsenic poisoning is usually done by analysis of body fluids like urine or blood for urine we usually go for 24 hour excretion so the patient may have to be admitted to hospital and if this level in you know exceeds 100 mg indicative of toxicity blood levels are easier to perform don't have to go for 24 hour you know uh, excretion like in urine there's no such thing in blood so it is just spot examination 
therefore it is not all that reliable but it's convenient and much of the time we can get results which are more or less confirmatory. Hair analysis, a lot of importance is given by some uh, books. I feel that hair analysis should be reserved for forensic cases more than clinical. It's quite a cumbersome and a very expensive method and it's not easily performed also. The usual methodology is of course atomic absorption spectroscopy. But like I touched upon earlier, there are better methods today like for instance ICP-MS, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry or ICP-AES, inductively coupled plasma atomic emission spectrophotometry. Yes, I told you, I'll give you a list of radio opaque poisons because this is again a favorite in the examination. So I've given you a mnemonic here, CHIPES, C-H-I-P-E-S. Sometimes, you know, you hear people pronouncing this as CHIPS, but don't forget the E. Each letter stands for an example. So it's actually an acronym, an abbreviation that can be read off like a word, where each letter stands for something. Here C stands for chloral hydrate, H for all heavy metals, I for iodides, P for phenothiazine drugs, E for enteric coated preparations and S for salicylates. Easy to remember, isn't it? Do remember because it is an important practical point and an important question that is often asked in the examination. Coming to treatment of arsenic poisoning, acute toxicity can be life-threatening like in the case of cholera because of uh, rapid depletion of fluids, of fluid and electrolytes from the body and therefore you have to replenish. In the hospital, the person has to be monitored carefully for evidence of fluid and electrolyte imbalance and this has to be rectified. One of the most important aspects of treatment in acute poisoning. There may be other things also that you need to do, but do not forget to mention chelation. The chelating agents listed here are the antidotes for arsenic. What we usually use in India is BAL, which stands for British anti lewisite though the actual name is Dimercaprol. That is uh, easily available. It is administered at the dose of about 3 to 5 mg per kg intramuscular injection, deep intramuscular. Every 4 hours, till the urine level dips to less than 50 mg over 24 hours. Extremely painful therapy. You can imagine, in deep intramuscular injection, every 4 hours, the patient almost becomes a pin cushion. So, in Western countries, there are be better alternatives like DMSA, dimercaptosuccinic acid, and DMPS, dimercaptopropane sulfonic acid. They are used there, and unfortunately, we don't really have easy access to these antidotes in India. But the situation, I believe, is becoming better, and uh, there are hospitals which are able to get hold of these antidotes. Sometimes you may have to order them online. It's better to stock these antidotes in every major hospital. If there is real failure only, hemodialysis works. Otherwise, most metals, including arsenic, are not really dialyzable. We come back to the case that we discussed. This is what finally happened. The patient fortunately recovered. You can see he has taken this photograph again himself of the sole of his left foot which earlier was, you know, very badly affected and now you can see it's virtually normal. But this case became a medical evil case because actually it's a case of homicidal poisoning and it's a police case. It is sub -judice. so I will not go into the details. That is why the name of the patient and other details have not been disclosed and maybe one day when the whole issue has been resolved, we will have a special episode on homicidal arsenic poisoning using this particular case as an example. I am only happy that with the effective treatment here, we could get a complete cure. But every patient is not as lucky and sometimes a patient dies and if that happens, 
medical autopsy becomes essential like in a case of you know poisoning almost always you know that is necessary to be done here also it's mandatory and there are some features that you must look for at autopsy especially so called red velvet appearance of the stomach when you open it because of reddening it's a form of hemorrhagic gastritis and if it is focal in nature then it is called flea bitten stomach so remember the terms very commonly asked in the examination there is also often evidence of subendocardial hemorrhages in the heart and fatty degeneration of organs like liver and kidneys and do also remember that aside from routine viscera you must preserve certain additional samples for analysis chemical analysis like bunch of pulled hair don't cut don't snip with scissors because you need to have the roots so pulled hair a few strands at least 10 to 15 a little piece of bone preferably from a long bone like femur wedge of muscle preferably from the back and a piece of skin also from the back you should take samples in such a manner that the body does not get disfigured that's very important because when the body is handed over back to the relatives after investigations it should not have a disfigured appearance so do remember hair bone muscle skin some books mention nails in fact they mention all nails fingernails and uh, toenails and uh, some books even mention a kind of device called spencer wells forceps to pull the nail from the nail bed this is a horrific gruesome kind of procedure it should not be performed this is something that is totally obsolete outdated and a barbaric you know kind of procedure not necessary at all so don't add that to the list not necessary for nails to be submitted for analysis if you submit hair and bone in fact it is quite enough even muscle and skin may not be required all the time with regard to forensic or medical legal importance first of all mention homicidal poisoning because for some reason arsenic has been a poison of choice for homicidal poisoners especially in the west especially during the so called victorian era 19th century 18th century england uk and some parts of europe this has come down of course of late probably because there are better poisons available today than arsenic we'll come to those details when we discuss homicidal poisoning as a you know kind of separate episode later on sometime but don't forget to mention the case of napoleon bonaparte the french emperor who died tragically and there are so many kinds of conspiracy theories one very convincing kind of theory is that napoleon died of chronic arsenic poisoning where somebody deliberately or i should say a group of people deliberately poisoned him this is not the form to go into the details of this case please do read up it is there on the net the case of napoleon bonaparte with regard to arsenic poisoning aside from uh, homicidal poisoning arsenic is also involved in accidental poisoning that can result from industrial or occupational exposure most commonly sometimes through consumption of contaminated water especially what happened in west bengal a couple of decades ago when a lot of bore wells were you know sunk to solve the water problem and while the water problem was solved it gave rise to a new problem in the form of arsenic exposure which was present in this bore well water because of leaching from the soil and that resulted in almost epidemic proportions in certain parts of west bengal please do read up that also what happened in west bengal and of course today all that is in, you know been effectively managed and you don't have that kind of a situation today but it was a big tragedy at the time when it happened a few day, decades ago ayurvedic medicines not all some of them which are not properly processed and manufactured can contain heavy metals including arsenic and on chronic consumption can lead to especially chronic poisoning suicidal poisoning with heavy metals is very rare and so also is the case of arsenic so in the examination if you want to mention suicidal 
just mention it in passing but the most important are homicidal and accidental exposure so as far as uh, arsenic at a basic toxicology level is concerned this is sufficient and we will meet again and discuss another heavy metal like lead and mercury and iron and thallium later on in subsequent episodes stay safe stay secure stay happy bye